Hey guys, welcome to Learn Today RGCSC. This video is a tutorial for Physics, Paper 4 Theory, Variant 4-2 for October-November 2023 examinations. Question 1. A car accelerates uniformly in a straight line from rest at time t0. At time 3.2 seconds, the speed of the car is 13 meters per second. If we were to visualize this as a diagram, this is what it would look like. From rest meaning the initial velocity is 0 meters per second and at time 3.2 seconds, the speed of the car which is the final velocity was 13 meters per second. Question A part 1. Calculate the acceleration of the car. So we have to calculate the acceleration of the car from this period of time. The formula for acceleration is change in speed over change in time. So the change in speed here is the final velocity which is 13 meters per second take away the initial velocity which is 0 over the time period of 3.2 seconds and this will give you 4.1 meters per second square. Always leave your answers in two significant figures and do not forget to write your units in your answer. Part 2. Explain in words what is meant by the term acceleration. The definition of acceleration can be obtained by its formula whereby it is the change in speed or increase in velocity per unit time. Question B. The car travels at 13 meters per second from t equals to 3.2 seconds to t equals to 12 seconds. Part 1. Plot the speed time graph for the car from t equals to 0 to t equals to 12 seconds. This is a graph of speed versus time. The gradient of a speed time graph tells you its acceleration. This question might look intimidating but let's do it step by step. At time 0, it was mentioned at the question that the velocity was 0 meters per second. So at x-axis equals to 0, the y-axis which is speed is also 0. Next, it says that the car travels at 13 meters per second from 3.2 seconds to 12 seconds. So from here to here, it travels at a constant speed of 13 meters per second. The reason I say constant is because only one value is given. So from this point till this point, you can draw a horizontal line representing a constant speed which is 13 meters per second. And from the question here, it already mentions that the car accelerates uniformly from t0 to 3.2 seconds. Meaning that from 0 to 3.2 seconds here to here, the acceleration was uniform which is constant. Hence, you can draw a straight line. Part 2. Determine the distance traveled by the car between time 0 and 3.2 seconds. For a speed time graph, the distance traveled is the area under the graph. So we're going to calculate the area between time 0 to 3.2 seconds, which is this triangle. The formula for the area of a triangle is 1 over 2 times base times height. The base here is 3.2 and the height here is 13. And this will give you a value of 21 meters. Question C. The car decelerates from 13 meters per second to 0 meters per second at a constant deceleration. The mass of the car is 1,350 kilograms. The car travels 13 meters in 2 seconds as it decelerates. Show that the work done by the car as it decelerates is approximately 1.1 times 10 to the power of 5 joules. So if I were to illustrate the question, this is what it would look like. At time 0 until 2 seconds, the speed decreases from 13 meters per second to 0 meters per second when it stopped. The mass of the car is 1,350 kilograms and it travels a distance of 13 meters. We need to show that the work done is 1.1 times 10 to the power of 5 joules. Now let's identify what formula we can use in this question. You should know the formula of work done which is force times distance. We have already been given distance here which is 13 meters. However, we do not have the force given. Therefore, we need to find the value of the force first. Force can be calculated by either the formula of mass times acceleration or by change of momentum over time. Both of them are going to give you the same value. I'm just going to use F equals to MA here. The mass is 1350 kilograms and the acceleration is the final velocity 0 minus the initial velocity over 2 seconds. The force here is negative 8,775. 
We can ignore the negative because force is a vector quantity and this just shows the direction. Now I can substitute this value into the formula and get my work done, which is 114,075. Converting this into standard unit, I would get 1.1 times 10 to the power of 5 and the unit is joule. So there you go, you have shown that the work done is indeed 1.1 times 10 to the power of 5. On another day, the car in C travels a longer distance while it decelerates from 13 meters per second to 0 meters per second. The deceleration here is constant. So just to explain what causes the stopping distance to increase. So what happened here is initially it traveled 13 meters to stop, but on another day, it traveled a longer distance in order to stop. And they're asking us what could be the reason. For this question, you could give any logical reason. So what I can think was, was it was probably a rainy day. So it was more difficult to stop as the roads were more slippery. So I can say that it was a rainy day. Therefore, the roads were slippery, reducing the frictional force between the tires and road, causing it harder to stop. Question 2. Figure 2.1 shows an electric tumble dryer used to dry wet clothes. Question A. Hot air blows into the trunk. The air gains water vapor from the clothes, so the water from the cloth evaporates and goes into the hot air and then leaves the drum, so the air now leaves. The moist air enters the condenser, so the air over here that has left the drum contains a lot of water vapor from the cloth and it enters the condenser. So what happens is that when the air enters the condenser, the condenser would convert the air into liquid. Now the cool air leaves the condenser here passes through the heating element over here now the air will get hot and enter the drum again part one state the process by which the hot air removes water from the wet clothes water being removed into air this process is called evaporation part two the air is cooled as it passes through the condenser over here describe and explain one other way in which the air leaving the condenser, the air here, is different from the air entering the condenser, here. So we understood that the air that enter here, all the water vapor converts into liquid, and the air that comes out does not contain any water vapor anymore, meaning that this air is drier. So for the description, you can say that the air leaving the condenser is drier, and the reason is because the water vapor has condensed. Question B. The drum of the tumble dryer rotates, lifting up the wet clothes, which then fall down through the hot air. Part 1. Name the force that causes the clothes to fall down. So everything that pulls us back to the center of the earth is gravity. Part 2. When the drum rotates too fast, the clothes remain in contact with the wall of the drum. State the direction of the resultant force on the clothes during the circular motion. So assuming that this is the wall of the drum and these are the wet clothes, it will stick to the wall of the drum because the clothes are trying to move in a forward direction like this and the perpendicular force would act towards the center of the drum like this. So now you have a resultant force in this direction, hence your clothes would go here. And then this process will repeat. The cloth will try to go in a forward motion and then you will have a perpendicular force towards the center of the drum and you will have a resultant force like this. Hence, the cloth remains attached to the wall. So the direction of the resultant force is perpendicular to the motion. Question C. Suggest why using a clothes line to dry clothes in the open air is better for the environment than using an electric tumble dryer. Open air is a natural resources and will always be available Therefore, it's a better advantage as it is a renewable energy and also no greenhouse gases are produced. Question 3 Part A A balloon of mass 15 gram is glued to a straw. The straw is threaded on a horizontal string as shown in figure 3.1. The balloon is filled with air and then the air is released. So the air will be released over here. And as the air releases, and we can see that the balloon is now moving in this direction. As the air leaves the balloon, the balloon experiences a force, 
the balloon accelerates from rest. Remember, from rest means the initial velocity is 0 meters per second until it reaches a constant speed. When an object is at constant speed, it means that its resultant force is 0. It then travels 0 0.67 meters in 0 0.18 seconds at this constant speed. Explain in words what is meant by the term impulse. Whenever you are asked to define a term, you can always refer to its formula and use the formula as its definition. And the formula for impulse is force times time. All your definition will be listed in the course specification. Make sure you get one of these printed out for each of your subject. And over here under momentum, you can see that the definition for impulse is stated force times time for which force acts. And we can use this equation or the change in momentum. So that's the exact definition being written over here. Part 2. Calculate the resultant impulse on the balloon while it is accelerating. Again, if you see the formula, resultant impulse is also equals to the change of momentum. So in order to find out the resultant impulse, we can look for the change in momentum. The formula for change in momentum is mass of final velocity minus the mass of initial velocity. The mass of the balloon as stated is 15 grams. However, for the formula of momentum, we have to convert the mass into kilograms. So that would be 0 0.015 kilograms. Next, we have to substitute the value of velocity. However, in this question, the final velocity is not stated. It only says that after 0 0.18 seconds, it travels at a constant speed. But to use this formula, we are going to require our final velocity. The distance is given, which is 0 0.67 meters. And the time is also given, which is 0 0.18 seconds. Using the formula speed equals to distance over time, we can find the value of the final velocity, which is 3.72 meters per second. So we can substitute that value into the formula here. Minus the mass times the initial velocity, which is 0. And we will get a value of 0 0.056. The unit for impulse is Newton second. Don't forget your units and make sure your answers is in two significant figures. Next question. Explain how momentum is conserved as the balloon accelerates. According to Newton's third law of motion, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So momentum is conserved when the momentum of air in this direction and the momentum of balloon in this direction equals to each other. Question B. Figure 3.2 shows the directions of two forces acting on a different balloon as it moves. So 0 0.4 Newton force is being pulled to the right and 0 0.74 Newtons is acting downwards. You are asked to determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant force on the balloon. As you can see in this question, it did not specifically tell you whether you should draw or calculate to find its magnitude and direction, meaning that you can use either one of this method to get your answers. And the method that I'm going to use here is calculation. I have made a video specifically on how to calculate and draw resultant force. You can find the link of the video on your top right corner and watch it if you need extra guidance. So firstly, I would sketch out the forces. So when I have a force on this and this direction, we know that the resultant force would act somewhere in this direction. So what I'm going to do next is make this all into a triangle looking like this. Remember, this is just a sketch, so it doesn't have to be according to scale. So to find the magnitude, I have to find the value of this. And to find the direction, I need to find the angle over here. So using Pythagoras theorem, I will be able to find out this magnitude. So the value of A is 0 0.4 square, B is 0 0.7 square. And if I bring square to the other side, it will become square root. So the value of C is 0.84 newtons. And the next is to find its direction. For the direction, we need to calculate the angle. Using the rule of trigonometry to find angle, we have the value of the opposite and the value of its adjacent. Opposite over adjacent means that we will be using the tangent rule. If you're unclear or unfamiliar with how I got this, Please watch videos on trigonometry so katwa. This is under mathematics and you have to apply it for this type of question. Okay, moving on, let's substitute all the values. 
we're looking to find angle. Tan brought into the other side will be tangent shift. Opposite of the angle is 0 0.74 and the adjacent to the angle is 0 0.4. So the value of theta here would be 62 degree. So your magnitude is 0 0.84 newtons and the direction relative to the horizontal force so this is your horizontal force and this is your resultant force. That is the reason why we are looking for this angle and not this angle. So the value of the angle is 62 degree. Question 4. Figure 4.1 shows a bottle part filled with water. The air inside the bottle is at the same pressure as the air outside the bottle. Meaning that the pressure in is equal to the pressure out. Pressure out is the pressure of atmosphere, which is 1 times 10 to the power of 5 Pascal. The bottle and its contents are at room temperature. Question A. The temperature of the balloon and its contents are increased. Part 1. Explain, in terms of particles, how the air pressure inside the balloon changes as the temperature increases. When temperature is increased, the particles will gain kinetic energy and the speed of particles will increase, causing them to have more frequent collisions with each other and the wall of the bottle. We have learned that the formula of pressure tells us that it is force over area. These collisions now would create a greater force per unit area. If there is a greater force per unit area, the pressure will also increase. So this is what you can write to gain a complete 3 marks. I'm only writing my answers in point form so that you see how the marks are given. Please do not write like this in your examinations. Part 2. The lid is removed from the bottle. State and explain how the air pressure inside of the bottle changes. Well, if the lid is now being removed, these particles will leave the bottle and the pressure will be decreased. So that's what you're going to write. Question B. The mass of water in the bottle is 0.18 kilograms. The specific heat capacity of water is 4200. Calculate the thermal energy needed to increase the temperature of the water by 20 degrees Celsius. This question is from chapter 2. Please remember that in chapter 2, there are only two types of calculation that can be asked. The first one is Boyle's Law and the formula that you should know is P1V1 equals to P2V2. And the second one is specific heat capacity. And the formula is E equals to mc theta. And this question is on specific heat capacity. And since you're asked to calculate, you can straight away write the formula, which is E equals to m times c times theta. So the mass is already given, which is 0 0.18 kilograms multiplied by specific heat capacity and the change of temperature. And you will obtain a value of... 1.5 times 10 to the power of 4 and your unit here is joules. This is a very direct question and it's very easy. There is no any trick in this question but the usual trick is that the mass is always given in gram and you have to convert it into kilograms. And if you forget on your day of exam whether it should be grams or kilograms, you can always look at the value given for specific heat capacity and if it's in kilogram then follow exactly the same. Question C. Another plastic bottle is filled to the top with water. The height of the bottle is 40 cm. The density of water is 1.0 times 10 to the power of 3 kg per meter cube. Calculate the pressure difference between the top and bottom of water. Okay, first of all, let's try to understand the question. The height of the bottle is 40 cm and the density of the water is 1 times 10 to the power of 3 kg meter cube. As mentioned previously, the questions in your exam always play with units. You can see here that the density is per meter cube, but they gave you the height in centimeters. So make sure your first step is to remember to do unit conversion. So the height would be 0 0.4 meters. So we are asked to calculate the pressure between the top and the bottom. So we just need to calculate the pressure inside here. To calculate pressure in liquid, the formula is density times gravity times the change in height. The density is already given. The value of G is fixed, 9.8, and the change of height is 0 0.4. And you will get a value of 3920 pascals. Remember, you should leave your answers only in two significant figures. That will give you a final answer of 3900 pascals. Question 5. 
Figure 5.1 shows a road junction, a moving car, and a stationary truck. The road has high walls on each side. Question A. The driver of the truck is at position X, over here. The car moves around the corner. So the car is moving around the corner like this. On Figure 5.1, label a point Y on the road where the truck driver first sees the car. So we are required to indicate a position on the road where the truck driver over here will be able to see the car. So since there are extremely high walls here, his vision is a little bit restricted. So I think that the truck driver first sees the car when the car is somewhere around here. So we'll label this point as Y. Next for question B, a plane mirror is placed at the road junction as shown in figure 5.2. Show how this mirror allows the driver of the truck to see the car when it is at the position shown in figure 5.2. Okay, so according to the position at 5.2, point Y is somewhere around here and this image will be reflected on the mirror and goes back to the truck driver like this. So this is your incident ray with incident angle and reflected ray with your reflected angle. Your incident angle has to be equal to your reflected angle. Question C. The truck driver wears spectacles to correct long-sightedness. Figure 5.3 shows how a blurred image of an object O forms on the retina. Any effect of the cornea on the rays of light can be ignored. Okay, on figure 5.4, show how long-sightedness is corrected by adding a suitable lens and continuing the part of the three rays of light until they meet to form an image. So this is figure 5.4 and we're supposed to draw a corrected image. Long-sightedness means that your image is formed behind of the retina. So we need to add a lens here to correct the rays of the image to form on the retina. So for long-sightedness, we are going to use a convex lens to focus all the point on the retina like this. If this was short-sightedness, the image would form in front of the retina and we are going to use a concave lens to extend the image and to form on the retina. So make sure that you add a convex lens correctly in front of the eye and make sure that the image is formed on the retina and you have three rays accordingly. That's how you will get a complete four marks.